Hi there, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio here. It's another first look, and this one is going to be a corker. From the mind of a former Nine Inch Nail, author of scores for the Leviathan-like franchise that is the Saw movie series, Resident Evil and Wayward Pines, and a very good friend, a Mr. Charles Klauser. Hi, Christian. It's great to be with you. How are you doing out there? Quite well, and having a great time playing with the finished product of Hammers. I have to say, you haven't seen my walkthrough yet, but I describe this library as transcendent. It's not just another drum library. It's one that will lift our craft to higher echelons. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, Charlie. I really do think that you've taken cinematic percussion on to a new chapter. Do you want to talk us through the thinking behind it? Well, those are pretty glowing terms. I hope I can live up to it. Like many of us, I've uh, been collecting sample drum and percussion libraries for oh, probably uh, 30 plus years, ever since the first Bob Clear Mountain audio CDs of drum samples. But I've been playing drums for about 45 years and sampling them for almost that long. And although I have a thousand percussion libraries, out of those thousand, there might be a hundred that are pretty good, 10 that are really pretty good, but zero that do what I want and that sound like my drums sound when I record them in my space with my techniques and my tunings and so on. So this entire effort behind Hammers was, I admit to a, a bit of a selfish motivation that it was to try to capture the sound that I use in my productions and in my scores and to, to put that under my fingertips in a way that is immediately use, usable and useful not just to me, but to the wider spectrum of, of film, television, and media composers, and even people making albums that want a slightly left of center or bigger than life uh, drum sound. Without further ado, should we just dive in and show everyone how it's structured and maybe play a, a few quick sounds? What I really love about Hammers is the cohesiveness and the consistency between the way that you treat the single hits versus the loops, and they're totally integratable. And I really look forward to showing people an example of how you work with both the loops and the hits to create something completely of your own, of, of, of course, all of the different mic signals and warps. But maybe we should just focus in on what loads up the first time you open Hammers. You know, the way Hammers is laid out is that uh, there are basically eight groups of drums. Uh, bass drums, surdu drums, tom-toms, rototoms, frame drums, darbukas, scrap metals, and then a bonus, which is a snare drum, which sounded too good in the room not to record. <laughs> and for each of those drums, we've recorded multiple articulations. Some of the drums, like darbukas and frame drums, we would have center and edge hits, which have a different tonality. In most of the drums, we've recorded different ensemble sizes. So you would have an individual drum, one player hitting it, one stick at a time. Then we'd have a two-player ensemble, which is two hands, two sticks, hitting two drums at the same time. And then for many of them, we have four-player ensembles, which we all had to pile into the room together and play four sticks, four arms on four drums. And of course, that always sounds different to just stacking up individual samples as the, as the sound reacts with each other in the room. And the way it's kind of laid out inside the, the finished product is that we do have a quick grab bag patch called Ensembles, which is the first one that comes up in the, the preset load list. And that's pretty much every drum all laid out as a continuous map across 88 keys. So that for people that just want to get up and running and hear the sounds quickly, this gives them a way to zoom in on which sounds they might want to then load up the individual articulations of. We have the bass drums at the bottom, move our way through surdus, then the toms, and it's generally moving upwards in pitch. So the biggest, lowest pitch drums are at the bottom of the keyboard and moves, moves our way up through frame drums and darbukas and 
up to the scrap metals up at the top. Of course, you can use that as a, as a way to uh, create a finished track. But um, I kind of think of that as the sort of grab bag sampler patch that is, helps people get familiar with what, what lies under the hood of the more detailed patches. So after the ensembles patch, the first thing that appears in the uh, preset load menu is bass drums. And uh, we have a few choices of sounds within that. The first technique is solo bass drums damped, which is one drummer, one stick, one drum at a time with dampers on so that they don't ring out entirely too long. And it's interesting, Charlie, because we've got them laid out so that you can use them as a, as a single hit like that, but also multiple key or indeed with two hands. Something that I found really just brilliant about the library, and again, it really smacked of someone who's, dare I say it, been round the block and has been doing this for a number of years, is that, that something that really marks it out is the consistency, not only between the different single hits, but actually the loops as well. There's a, there's a kind of an internal logic to it. Absolutely, and you know, this was the, the scheme by which we map things onto the keyboard uh, was born of long suffering. <laughs> my part and many years of having sampled instruments where that didn't feel like the drums were on the correct keys to make them easily playable. The way in which we're mapping things uh, is it was important that it be consistent and repeatable across all the different drum types, but also that it was playable. You know, some people like to play in their percussion parts from a drum pad or an Akai type drum machine pad, and I do too, but let's be fair a large majority of drum programming is done from a music keyboard. So it's important to me that the, the way in which we distributed the samples on the keyboard made for easy playing. And when we were recording this, we didn't just capture the single hits. Of course, we also captured roughs, rolls, and flams. And then how to distribute those across the keyboard became a bit of a, of a question mark. Basically, every drum occupies a six key brick so half an octave. The order in which the sounds are mapped within those six key bricks is absolutely consistent and repeats across the keyboard. Since I'm a fan of finger drumming on the music keyboard, what I thought we should do is have three keys which are the main hits, C, D, and E in the bottom half of the octave, and then F sharp, G sharp, A sharp for the top half of the octave. The underlying samples are the same in those keys, and that just gives you a, a more space to work with. Like many people, my right hand works better than my left, so I tend to play with two fingers on, say, the D and the E with my right hand, and then just one finger of my left hand on the C. But that lets me play rolls and elaborate parts. Sort of going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it also makes it easier to play little roughs and ornaments. Then what we did is we put the flams, roughs, and rolls, which sound like this, the flam, and the rough, and the roll. We put those on the keys in between the hits. This combination of the mapping just makes it so fast, for me anyway, to to play realistic parts that are full of ornaments without a lot of mousing around and drawing in individual notes in the piano roll to achieve what I hope will sound like a realistic performance. That little six key mini map repeats up the keyboard. So if you've worked out a part on one drum, it's a simple matter to shift it up the keyboard by an octave or half an octave to hear that same performance played on a different drum. And that mapping is consistent across all the different drum types. So it's a simple matter to take a, a performance from one instrument and put it on a different track and hear it played with a different drum without any fiddling around to the underlying MIDI performance at all. Why this library ticks all the boxes for me is it, it, it has the possibility, as you will see, to really get into the weeds and create incredibly complex dynamic rhythm parts. But it's also very quick and intuitive to use. 
But I think most importantly is, uh, from my experience of meeting other composers, I think for many composers, the Achilles heel is engineering. And the way these things have been recorded and engineered is just staggering. I don't know if you want to look at the, the bass drums, but the, the different bass drums that you have here just sound incredible. My primary drum kit has always been the Ludwig Vistalite orange plastic John Bonham kits, which have sort of oversized bass drums. I did call in a favor and got from a good friend, John Tempesta, the drummer from Rob Zombie and White Zombie, The Cult, and many other heavy bands. I called in a favor to him and borrowed his Ludwig stainless steel John Bonham kit. And so when you put the Ludwig orange Vistalite next to the Ludwig stainless kit, it's just an ungodly roar. <laughs> and in the collection of bass drums, besides those Ludwig John Bonham kicks, we also have the concert bass drums that MB Gordy lent us. The Ludwig kicks are big, but the uh, MB Gordy kicks are even bigger. Between those drums available in both the damped and open version, you can really move some air. I see that you've got three mixes and then a, a whole bunch of mics. Could you take, the, take us through those, Charlie? We basically recorded uh, close mics, overheads, room mics, which were much further away, and so a couple of specialty mics. The space we're recording in here at my house is 23 feet high and has a catwalk running across it. So one of the specialty mics was the catwalk mic. It was a, an AKG 451 that was 20 feet off the floor pointed down at the drums. The other specialty mic was the chimney mic. We had one more channel left on the, on the recording chain. We thought, where can we put a, a bonus mic? And it turned out that the chimney had this unusual sound quality which really created this, this constrained but long low frequency sustain. And if I solo up that signal on some of the bass drums, after the recording, my first job was to sort of clean up and solidify the original recording signals. So the first signal is the close mics and they wind up despite the fact that we're in a very reverberant space, they wind up having a fairly close and dry sound. The next signal is the overhead mics, which were about six feet above the drums, and they provide just a good all-around picture with a bit of room, but not too much fluff. Then the room mics were much further back. They were about 20, 25 feet away from the drums. And we used omnidirectional Shups microphones way up high so that they would capture a lot of the weird ambience from the back of the space. Now, of course, for people working in surround, if you route the room mics to the rear speakers, you get an amazing immersive picture of the recording space. But of course, mixing all three signals just into a stereo pair provides sort of the a beefy and realistic picture. That is what mix one is. So mix one in the signals in hammers is primarily uh, a straight fader mix of those three mic positions, close, overhead, and room. It's not too wet. It's, for lack of a better term, the normal sound. Then as I was continuing with my processing, I started getting a little wilder, and doing some of the stuff that I normally do to my own recordings, which involves multiple layers of compression, sometimes to extreme degrees, uh, sometimes using devices like the, uh, the UBK Fatso, which is a modified Empirical Labs Fatso that has crazy compression, and also doing things like running pitch shifters on the drums and using some plugins that allow me to separate the attack portion from the sustain portion, adding pitch shifting just to the sustain, but not to the attack and so forth, and really getting a little crazier. The first set of results of that level of processing are combined to create mix two, which is 
a little more turbocharged than mix one and sounds like this. Much more beefy, much more solid. Then I decided to really put the boot to the signal <laughs> and that resulted in mix number three, which is the most over the top and turbocharged version. And this is usually the one that I would use in, when I'm really trying to put the hurt on the signal. And it's the, the biggest, the wettest, the fattest with the most uh, artificial enhancements. And in the course of creating the, the raw signals for those mixes, I did print all of the components that made those up. Those are presented in the, the final product as additional signals on the second page, which are referred to as close pitch, over pitch, and room pitch. And those are generally the ingredients that were used to make mixes two and three. However, just turning them all on won't exactly equal mix two or three because I was adding some extra special sauce, but I felt that it was important to deliver those results so that people wouldn't have to struggle to reverse engineer what went into mixes two and three if they wanted to adjust the individual ratios of the room to overhead, for instance. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. And I guess the, the sub channel is something that you can feed to the LFE channel as well. Absolutely. And the sub channel, a lot of times if you're uh, working with just the, the close mics, for instance, or close and overheads, you might uh, want to have more beef without more wetness. So adding the sub channel behind the, the close and or overheads really adds some bottom end thrust without adding any reverb or uh, any additional tonality to the sound. And of course, as you said, it's great to route to an LFE channel which will really shake the room. And talking of reverbs, there's been a lot of attention. Again, we want something that is something that, you know, for real high-end users, you can get into the weeds, but also someone just wanting something that springs out of the box. It does ship with an extraordinary selection of reverbs, does it not? I've always preferred recording in smaller spaces, although the, the space we recorded this in is not small by any means, but it's not scoring stage levels of hang time. It's not the Air Studios Lindhurst. Um, and it doesn't have that sort of nine second hang time on the reverb. My reasoning behind that is that, you know, many of my favorite drum sounds are, for instance, uh, the sounds that uh, Steve Albini got on Nirvana records. They're thick, they're burly, but they're not overly long. There's a few reasons why I prefer to use that type of, to record drums in those type of spaces. In the first place, I feel that it's easier to get convincing results with artificial reverbs, whether they're convolutions or algorithmic reverbs, when you're working with long tails. And that short reverbs are much more difficult to simulate. And I'm never convinced by short reverbs that are added after the fact nearly as well as I am at, by long reverbs. So, you know, if you have a Bricasti and you add a lovely scoring stage reverb, it sounds absolutely convincing and amazing. The other side of the argument is that it's much easier to add reverb than to take it away. So if we had recorded these in a giant cavernous space with this monstrous hang time, then it would be very difficult to get realistic results by shortening the release times on the samples or anything like that. So. My first argument was that we did need to record in a space that has the kind of sound character I like and the reverb character I like, which is brash, dense, but not overly long. And then we would supplement the recordings with a series of impulse responses and convolution reverbs inside the plugin that allowed you to pick a variety of spaces to lengthen that tail or to add different characters to the sound. And we do have a wonderful selection of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 reverbs. Some of my favorites of the included reverbs are drum chamber and stone. For instance, if I go to just the close and overhead mics on these toms and uh, listen to it through drum chamber, and I'll turn the reverb up. Here it is with no reverb, no artificial reverb.
And if we add a good dose of drum chamber impulse within the plugin, it still sounds realistic and wetter, but not a ridiculous huge hang time. Another favorite is the Stone Room, which is sort of short, reminds me of the, you know, the classic Phil Collins recorded at the Stone Room in the Manor. And again, to compare it to dry. So that having these impulses inside the plugin allows you to work with just, for instance, the close mics, which sound dry like this. And then to add the reverb of your choice from our drop down list. So you can get a little bit of air and hair on the sound if you want, or you can go quite large. For instance, dark chamber sounds like this. And of course, these really come to life when you are using some of the natural reverb in the overhead or room layers, or any of the mix one, mix two, mix three signals, and then pump those through some of the larger reverbs, and then things really wake up. So it's quite easy to get the traditional epic cinematic sound, and you're never gonna be stuck with the particular reverb that we've recorded this, the drums in. But all of these sounds have such kind of attack and bite as well. There's um, such an amazing aggressiveness to them. Now, if we look here in the middle button, we've got the reverb as the, the first thing that uh, uh, kind of pops up there, but we've also got a low pass filter. But this reverse section, this is a new feature, which I'm quite excited about. Every drum programmer loves a good backwards tom-tom as a suck in to some dramatic section. And I do that kind of thing all the time uh, in my own recordings, and to have it available as a, a control right in the UI of the plugin meant that any sound, whether it's a loop or any of the single hits or any of the warps, they can all be reversed. If a loop is reversed, it will play in time, tempo sync to your host DAW, and it makes it easy to create intricate little nuances within the patterns, as well as to do the, the uh, everybody's favorite trailer drums hit, where you have a big backwards hit that sort of sucks you into an impactful moment. The way it's been implemented by the genius team at Spitfire Audio is that instead of just being a switch, it's a knob which controls how far ahead of the point you want the sample to end, you need to trigger it. So if you had set it to a, just the, the lowest interval, which is 16th note, the samples are quite short, and they suck up quite quickly. But if you wanna have a longer, more graceful swoop in, you can go all the way up to an entire whole note. And that lets you have a much more gradual and epic swoop into some dramatic section. And of course, when the loop, when you start messing with reverse loops, then things really get wild. The, my most common use of reversed stuff, besides the, the epic suck into a hit, is for some of the smaller percussion, like the, the scrap metals. So if I go to just any one of the random scrap metals, and I'll get a fairly dry signal, I'll use mix one, fairly dry. Something I often do is use sounds like that in reverse to create little accents like that might sound like this. Being able to reverse any of the single hits or any of the loops was a flag that I waved pretty hard at the development team and they've implemented it in a, a, in a way that is even better than I imagined because of that adjustable start time for all the reversed samples. And, and Charlie, what I find most exciting about uh, th this implementation is the fact that you can actually, uh, you can control it with a MIDI controller in real time. So, so this is off, i.e. forward, and then. So I think there's a lot of fun to be had there. Yeah, and it should make the, the, the dramatic effects of working with reversed samples so much quicker and easier than the old way that I always did it, which is, record a piece of audio and painstakingly put it on another track, flip it backwards, manually line it up against the grid so that it sounds in time. This way of working with reversed samples and loops 
is the the best implementation that I've found yet. So that's one of the many new features included in Hammers. And you'll see that we've also got a compress and a normalize function. We'd love to get into everything here today, but we won't get through it in the time allotted. So do check out my walkthrough in the video description down below. Right, Charlie, isn't it time we moved along to the loops? Yes, let's. <laughs> Although this wasn't uh, isn't a typical component of a lot of Spitfire products, I admit to using loops all the time. And so when, when we were thinking about including per live performance loops in hammers, the, my first thought was that I had to compose the parts that would be recorded in such a way that they can be thought of as molecules, not atoms. So these are not one finger action cue type of loops where you hit one key and you say, well, my job is done here. These are the molecules which make up the atoms of your music. Um, and they all work together so that you can layer and copy and paste MIDI parts between tracks and have things uh, stack up in a way that makes musical sense. So it was a bit of a you know, head scratcher as I was working on the guide tracks that we played along to while recording them so that things would all work in sync and in situ with each other. Now, as you may or may not know, Charlie, I, I broke into doing orchestral uh, film music by actually being a, a drum programmer for the likes of Harry Gregson Williams and Ann Dudley. So I was somewhat cynical about, uh, you know, a, a leopard changing his spots or a, an old dog learning new tricks. But you have really schooled me here. And I think it is a masterclass in drum programming in itself. I think one of the rookie errors I hear a lot is people using really low fat drums to play very fast sections. And in fact, they can play fast, but it gets very tiresome if they're playing kind of continuously. So what I've noticed is lower down, it tends to be slightly more pointillistic and it gets busier as you move up in pitch. Absolutely. And that's, you know, what you just said is exactly what you learn by either playing the drums or working with samples or loops and then getting unsatisfactory results or results that don't work as well in the final piece of music as you thought they were going to when you were working on them. And so as a result, we wind up with things where uh, the lower frequency, the bigger drums, bass drums, surdus, and toms, have much more, as you said, a, a sparser rhythmic feel so that you can not only hear the lovely decay time on the individual drums, but also that gives you empty space within which you can place the more detailed and rapid ticky tacks and brushes on frame drums and those sort of patterns, which are more sort of linear in our collection, are more sort of linear and uh, uh, rapid. You know, for instance, uh, some of the loops in the in the Surdu section have, uh, you know, a, a lot of air between them, and some of them sound like this. Big accents, lots of hang time, but they're not hammering away. Uh, of course, there are some that, that do have a much more rapid and linear feel. Some softer hits taxiing along in the background. And, and, and therein lies another lesson, is that it's about them not just hammering away at the same velocity. You know, it's about that light and shade that gives it all of the character and groove. Absolutely. And over the decades, there's been a lot of argument about uh, where does human feel come from? And what, you know, I, I'm sure you remember the days of uh, uh, analyzing James Brown and John Bonham drum parts and finding the timing inaccuracies and what made them sound the way they sounded. And a lot of times when you're working with programmed drums and you try to introduce timing inaccuracies to simulate a groove, if you're not a very experienced programmer or drummer, that way can lead to madness as you start to ruin <laughs> ruin a tight performance and turn it into an, uh, an out-of-kilter mess. But what I've found is that a huge component of the human feel is not necessarily the timing inaccuracies. It's more about the dynamic the ratio of soft to loud hits and the way in which those relate to each other. So that when you have parts uh, that have a lot of dynamics in them, which if I can find one here in the tom loop section. Uh, 
you know, those loud hits are loud. And then there's the small, the softer hits that are taxiing along in the background. And therein lies this sense of humanity when you're working with those. And of course, it's quite possible to do it with the uh, individual single hits as well, because we recorded such a wide range of dynamics. But those are the factors that combine, to me anyway, to help create a realistic finished product. And there's a really interesting and very intuitive feature, Charlie, which is the, and this is something that you can enable and disable, but it follows tempo, but also in a more curated sense. So if you see here, what I've done is I've programmed, uh, it starts at 90 and then it goes up to 110 and then back again. And just have a look at what happens. So you'll hear the loop speed up, but then when it hits the 110 mark, it actually switches to a more suitable pattern. So if we put the rotor toms on here, absolutely brilliant. Obviously having host sync and time stretching abilities within the plugin is fantastic, but there's a sort of a limit to how far things can be stretched before they start to sound unnatural, not necessarily because of artifacts created by the time stretching process, but just because a part that was played originally at one tempo might not be the same kind of part you would play at a faster or slower tempo. So that's why we were very, it was a bit of a painstaking adventure to determine what the best target tempos were to record these performances at and then to develop the performances that suited those tempos. So that's how we wound up with core tempos of 70, 90, 110, 130, and 150 BPM. Of course, if someone wants, they can slow down the 150 BPM loops down to 70. There might be some artifacts, depending on what uh, pitch change or time stretching algorithm they choose, but more likely it'll be that the underlying musical content doesn't sound appropriate to be slowed down so extremely. So that's why it was important to not just bash in a ton of loops at 120 or whatever, but to address each of the different situations that these various tempos might suit. And I think what I, I was really relieved as a traditional emu user, but I think you Akai sample users as well, will, will value the fact that there is a retro, just your normal standard, you can just pitch up, up or down to get those loops uh, in time, should you so wish. That retro pitch algorithm, that was definitely uh, a request of mine because that's something I do a lot of times, whether I'm working with samplers or in Ableton Live is sometimes, and it's not because of the artifacts, it's because of that unique sonics that happen when you slow something down. Um, and you don't correct its pitch, and you don't force it to be digitally adapted to the new tempo. And uh, so to have that as an option uh, was important to me, and I think it, it really widens the, the scope of results that you can get out of this plugin. Now, I'm going to segue us into the warps by playing the bass. And this is, again, what I really, really love about the library, and this is something that I attempted to do with our Solstice library, is to stop people thinking of loops and hits as a, as a separate way of working, a separate workflow. So there's a continuity between the hits, the loops, and the warped loops. So let me just play you this uh, bass drum loop here, very simple. Beautiful. Now what I'm gonna do is add in a warped version. Let's hear that. So before I get carried away there, Charlie, can you talk us through the warps? Yeah, the, you know, the warp selection of material is, is not just some bonus folder that's sitting at the bottom of the list. That's, to, to me, it's a primary component of what we wanted to do with this. And it's a primary component that represents the the sounds that I use and would create in any normal production where I would have some source recordings and then I would put the boot to them on a long night with the modular synths, the hardware, outboard gear, a zillion plugins, and anything else I can think of to add unique and or almost synthy 
kind of textures to them. But there, as you mentioned, there is uh, absolute continuity between the, the warps and the source loop material. If you're working with a given loop, for instance, if I go to uh, the, the toms and I hear a loop that has a rhythm part I like, I go to the corresponding warped tom loops. The underlying musical material behind them is exactly the same and on the same keys. So that if you're working with in either category, you can go from the loops to the warps or from the warps to the loops and find the, the same musical material under the same key without fishing around, hammering away at the keyboard trying to find where did that sample go. As you can see in the UI, there are 12 different warps available. So under any given key, the musical material that underlies that key will be the same for all 12 warps. And the 12 warps are different processes and different sonic results based on that same musical material. And one thing I tried to do, because I do it myself a lot, I might have a tom part or a rototom part that I think, I, I really like the part that this is playing, but I don't want it to sound like a tom-tom, I want it to sound like a maraca. And as we know, with enough modular synth gear and enough plugins, you can go from a surdu drum all the way to a maraca. So I tried to do that in the warp so that any given uh, warp section might have signals that range that span the spectrum from low distorted grunts all the way up to shakers, maracas, and tiki tacks. And it might take me a second to find them, but let's take a scan through the Tom's warps, for instance. The first one. Lovely, gritty, noisy, and distorted and filtered. The second one. Even more filter and step sequencer action. The third one. Sort of cybernetic bit crushed, fixed frequency resonant bank type of sound. The fourth one. More legible, but still with some trance gate and filter step sequencing. The fifth one. So what was a beefy tom-tom has now become almost a hand-clapped noise percussion. The sixth one. More step sequence, low frequency filter action. And as we get into the second page of warps, things get a little more extreme. So the seventh one. A more aggressive trance gate effect. The eighth one. Speaker destruction, I believe. <laughs> the uh, ninth one. Even more distortion, but with a kind of a mid-range tone. So as you can see, by the time we get through all the warps, you've spanned the spectrum from low frequency distortion to synth pulse type of beds, all the way up to high frequency percussion. And the inverse is the case as well. When you're working with uh, warps that were based on a more high frequency drum, like the darbukas, the frame drums, or the scrap metals, you'll find warps in there that are pitched down and filtered down and step sequenced so that they take on a character at the bottom end of the spectrum even though the source material was at the higher end of the spectrum. Something I find so exciting about the way this has been implemented is the way in which it's not just about an infinite number of selections that you can make into your own. It's about what you can also alter in real time. And that for action sequences, for your additive music within computer games and your TV pr police procedures is absolutely key to making sequences really interesting. I mean, the number of times I've had directors say it just sounds a bit loopy, as in a bit repetitive. So I've actually assigned warps one, two, and five of that bass drum loop that we we're listening to, to these faders. I can just show you what you can do in real time here. So just everything's triggering from the same note. So 
you've got not only a loop with your own selection of warps on it, it's evolving to fit with your picture. And I'm just going to add a few other a, a warped frame drum in. So just the intensity is really... And then I've got another warped frame drum here. Sorry, I said Tom, so it's Tom's. And support Tom's. So its use for drama is absolutely just phenomenal because it, you can create t tension by things gradually building within a loop. It's not just this static moment in time that's not changing. I'm glad you picked up on that because that was exactly the mission was to have a wide variety of results from a given musical idea that, because as, as you know, when you're fishing through any kind of phrase library, you might find something that is, out of a thousand samples, there might be one that really rings your bell and none of the others work at all for what you're working, for the piece of music you're working on. And you only wish you had a million sub variations on that core musical idea. And that's what this whole world of our loops and warps and the way they're laid out on the keyboard and the way that the signals are presented in the user interface, that was entirely the mission there, was to give a wide variety of results from a given musical idea. It's absolutely splendid. Now, you mentioned about key, kind of key bricks earlier before. There's a logic to the way these loops uh, organize, but also one of my biggest frustrations with working with loops is how to end them. Anybody who's ever worked with chopping up loops as audio uh, ha has tried to conquer the, the problem of the end hit and trying to find one drum hit within a long performance that has a long enough tail that you can paste it onto the end of a phrase and have it sound natural and not like it's being cut off. So it was very important when we recorded these loops that all of them had a solid end hit with a long two bar ring out. And the way we've presented the loops mapped on the keyboard, the source loops were all recorded as eight bar long phrases plus an end hit that rings out. So the way they're presented in each six key brick, much like the single hits, the bricks are six keys and repeat up the keyboard. The first key, which would be a, the C or the F sharp, is the entire eight bar loop without the end hit, but looping smoothly. So it'll play the entire duration of the recording. The next key up will play the first two bar section of it, the next key, the following two bar section, and so forth. So the first key is the whole eight bars. The next four keys are each two bar section looped smoothly. And then the final key is the end hit. So that lets you do some interesting things because of course the end hit can be treated almost like uh, a single hit from one of the drum maps, but it matches exactly to the tone and the force with which that loop was played. And the warp. And this is also the case with the warps. All the warps have the end hit. All the warps are laid out on the keyboard in the same manner as the, the source loops. Another thing that we did at my request was we put the end hits at the bottom of the keyboard grouped together reversed. So that whenever you're working with a loop, you always have, without using the reverse knob in the UI, you always have a reversed version of all those end hits. So you can quickly create those epic suck ups into a downbeat and they are very easy to operate and they sound a little something like this. So it makes short work of creating monster pull-ins to dramatic moments. And of course, because of the way the loops are laid out on the keyboard, you can quickly create new patterns that are based on some of the source material. You might find a loop that has, <laughs> begins with a couple rapid hits, and you can almost use that and it, its accompanying end hit as a way to build fills. and insert that in the midst of another loop that's playing in some of the empty space that 
is within that loop. So you might be able to go. And insert bits and pieces of other loops or end hits within a sparser loop to add more variation and to change things up as it progresses. I think what's so great about how you've got these sparse loops is that you can complexify them just with the single hits. And that's what I mean about this being an, an entirely cohesive library. Let's just have a look at that bass drum, the original one here. So it's really seamless, this, this idea of a loop and a hit, it's totally integrated. It, it was no uh, accident. It took a lot of planning on the front end of developing the material that would be recorded. And then of course, a lot of work on the back end uh, by the development team at Spitfire to edit these loops so that the, all the component chunks l repeat smoothly and the, so that the end hits can be triggered and used as, as if they were a single hit in the rest of the library. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, as I said before, Charlie, I think that, that really you're, you're, you're taking cinematic drums on a chapter. And I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what people do with it. Oh, I absolutely am. And you know, even though I had a, a very selfish reason for embarking on this project, uh, I'm still uh, uh, anxiously awaiting watching some big epic action movie and hearing some of these sounds going, I recognize that. Absolutely. They do become like your babies and you you just you know like a like your child screaming in a in a playground. You go you you you, you do pick them out. There's a a phenomenon that when you're when you get to a certain point it's okay to release your babies out into the world and let other people dance with them. To find out more about Hammers, please check out the video description down below for links to the product page, demos, and my walkthrough video. Thanks so much, Charlie. This has been, it's been such a dream to complete our first project together, Spitfire and Charlie Klauser, and maybe we can do something more in the future. It's been an absolute pleasure for me, and I can't wait to see what we come up with next. <laughs> Excellent stuff. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do so. And remember to ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time we put a video up. One of those for Mr. Charles Klauser. See you soon.